I'm very excited to introduce tonight's presenter. Roy Schwartz is the author of Is Superman Circumcised? The Complete Jewish History of the World's Greatest Hero and the Darkness in Lee's Closet and the Others Waiting There. He has taught English and writing at CUNY and is a former writer in residence fellow uh, at New York Public Library. When not writing, he is the director of marketing and business development of a regional law firm. He can be found at RoySchwartz.com and on social media at, as at Real Roy Schwartz. Roy, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me and uh, Shavuot Sameach to everybody. And thank you for joining me, especially uh, the night owls and East Coasters. Um, I'm going to do a screen share. So give me a second. I want to make sure I'm sharing the right screen with everybody. Okay. And then we will uh, begin. Okay. Hmm. One second, please. Okay. Can everybody see my screen share? I'm not that interested to, uh, not interesting to look at. Everybody can see the slide? Okay, so let us begin. So I am Roy Schwartz. Uh, I am the author of Is Superman Circumcised? The Complete Jewish History of the World's Greatest Hero. The book just came out on the 14th. So um, two days ago, uh, saying I'm getting all kinds of messages. Uh, and as Rabbi Wallach said, he talked about how Jewish humor, is, you know, does not make one uh, bulletproof. It does, doesn't protect anybody from bullets. So we're gonna kind of uh, take that in the other direction. I'm gonna talk about all these Jewish themes that we can find in uh, superhero comics, particularly Superman. Uh, before we do that though, um, I want to make sure, I get asked this all the time, so the title of my book is designed to be cheeky. It is not literally a book about uh, Superman's Schmeckel. Uh, and I keep getting asked this all the time, is Superman circumcised? People really want to know if it's literally true, so I have to come up with some sort of answer. So uh, to those of you who don't know, on planet Krypton, Superman's daddy was Jor-El. Uh, Superman's birth name on planet Krypton was Kal-El. And if he was circumcised, it would have been by Moel. Okay. Uh, but again, the, the book isn't really about uh, superhero genitalia. Uh, it's about Jewish themes. And then the question is, is this guy really Jewish? I, I look at him. Uh, and the answer is yes. Superman is a Jewish character. He is the first superhero. He's arguably the greatest hero in contemporary fiction. And he is very much a Jewish character. His mythology is rich in Jewish themes, in Jewish symbolism, metaphor, stories borrowed wholesale from the Bible. I'll get that in a second. And it's like those uh, magic eye pictures you, they were popular in the 90s. Once you see what's behind it, you cannot see it anymore. That's all you're going to see. Um, and let's begin with the Jewish hero he's based most on, which is Moses. The greatest superhero is based on the greatest Jewish hero. Uh, some of you, you know, particularly people who are into comics and pop culture may have already heard some of these things. Uh, some of the stuff I'll talk about, I promise you haven't heard, uh, but I'll start at the beginning, making sure everybody is on the same kind of point. So Superman was created by two Jews, and I'll get to them in a bit, and they gave him the birth name on planet Krypton, Kal-El. Um, and what does Kal-El mean? El means God in Hebrew, right? Uh, El Malera Hamim, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the names of several angels and prophets in the Bible are theophoric names, meaning they're names that carry the name of God in them. Uh, like, for example, uh, Gabriel, Gavriel, uh, Daniel, Daniel, right? Um, Michael, Michael, uh, Israel, Israel, uh, and Kal El. Uh, so he very much falls within that tradition. Moses, by the way, likewise has a theophoric name, uh, less talked about, less kind of known. 
Uh, in Hebrew, Moshe combines the Hebrew root mash, which means to extricate. Uh, Moses and the letter Hey, which is one of the names of God, right? Uh, it's one of the common names of God throughout the Bible. Uh, he's extricated because he was drawn out of the water, delivered from death, uh, and he becomes a deliverer of the Israelites from bondage and to the promised land, from idol worship to God's law. Uh, and it equally means one saved by God and God's chosen savior, Moshe's Mashe. Um, the origin story of Superman and Moses is really where you can find the most parallels. Both are babies that need to be saved from catastrophe. Both are put in a small vessel to save their lives and are sent down, you know, one down the Nile, one down the Milky Way uh, to an unknown fate. They are both found amongst uh, thick set vegetation by people not their own are renamed, right? Bissia names Moshe, uh, Martha Clark, uh, Martha Kent names Clark and they are raised by people not their own. Um, and this has been talked about. What sort of has been ignored is that their teenage years, their chrysalis stage, uh, also parallels. Uh, if you have ever seen the Superman movie from 1978, the one with Christopher Even, if you haven't, you should, it's, it's wonderful. Um, when he turns 18, he journeys across the wilderness, in this case, the North Pole instead of the Sinai Desert. Uh, when he reaches the North Pole, he creates the Fortress of Solitude. Uh, where he encounters this bright hologram of his father, Joel. Um, and it's a powerful story element that's since been folded into the comics, as you see on the, the slide. And this bright apparition of his father tells him of his special heritage, where he comes from, what it means, and bestows upon him the responsibility of becoming a great savior. Um, granted, of his adoptive people rather than his uh, birth people, that's where the metaphor diverges. But again, this is not the... Uh, they didn't take Moses and just put a, a cape on him. This is a, a, you know, they were inspired by it. The same way the West Side Story was inspired by Romeo and Juliet or uh, James versus Ulysses was inspired by um, the Odyssey. So, okay. So Superman turns 18, goes across the wilderness, comes across this bright apparition uh, of a, a godly uh, father, tells him you need to go back and save people. And I'm sure that rings a bell if you've ever read Exodus uh, or the Haggadah. Uh, so Drell's hologram obviously is analogous to the burning bush. One is from fire, one is from ice, but it's the same function, it's the same aesthetic. Um, it plays the same role in the story. Um, according to the Midrash, by the way, God also started uh, speaking to Moses from the burning bush in the voice of his father Amram as to not scare him. And even their speech is very, very similar. Uh, you know, I am your father, I am the God of your father. I will send you, I will send you. You are the chosen, you are the chosen. You must save them, you must save them. The pattern is, is almost verbatim. Um, and of course, both go back and become heroes to their people. But Moses is not the only biblical hero that Superman is based on. Uh, the other one is Samson. And Superman's co-creator, Jerry Siegel, he wrote a, this, un, this memoir that never got published and got discovered in 2013. Nobody knew about it. And it's a bit of a treasure trove. And in it, he talks about how the legend of Samson from the Bible was one of his main uh, inspirations in creating Superman. And he regularly references Samson in the original comics. Uh, like you see this cover of um, Superman 4 that's clearly modeled after, uh, Mos after uh, Samson. And he compares, he says, Superman is as strong as a dozen Samsons. He's a modern Samson. Samson shows up a lot in the early comics. Um, Samson, known as Jewish tradition as uh, Samson the hero, Shimshon Gibor, is mostly famous for his super strength, right? He was mighty. He um, toppled the Philistine temple, like in this image. He, with the jawbone of a donkey, uh, um, uh, killed a thousand Philistines. He tore a lion in half. But he also, he wasn't just more powerful than locomotive. He was also faster than a spinning bullet. He actually chased down and caught 300 foxes. Uh, so he had super speed and he also was able to leap long distances in a single bound. In another Talmudic story, we find out that he leapt in one mighty leap from Tzora to Eshtol, which is roughly four miles. It's about six kilometers, uh, which is more impressive than what Superman could do back, uh, back in his early years. Um, equally important is that Samson, while he was a mighty man, he was a judge. This was a man who fought in the name of truth and justice. So the parallels there are clear. And again, Superman's co-creator admitted that this 
was one of his um, inspirations, and it's not something that's been um, talked enough about. Despite Moses and uh, Samson, in, in the public imagination, the public sphere, when you talk to people about, oh, there's, there's all these kind of religious themes and Superman, but so of course he's Jesus, right? Um, Superman is really generally perceived as a, as a Christ metaphor, and it makes sense. I mean, this is a, a celestial savior who came down to save us. His name is God. His dad's name is God. He got sent down to earth. Uh, he is not of humanity, but he saves humanity, etc. cetera. Um, and, and that's legitimate. He could do a lot worse for a role model. But these metaphors were really added later on, and they were particularly added, not in his comics and his ur text for the sake of this discussion, but um, on screen, in movies. And Superman movies from 78 and increasingly to date are uh, suffused with Christological uh, symbolism. Uh, one example is this one from Batman v Superman. He's hovering, there's always halos, um, whether it's the sun or a street lamp. Um, this is the poster for Smallville that debuted in, uh, in uh, 2001. And he's, he's literally crucified here. Uh, and that show had all kinds of uh, symbolism. In Superman Returns from 2006, there's a ton of stuff. Uh, his mother cradles him Pieta style. He gets stabbed in the side by uh, Lex Luthor, a la the Spear of Destiny, right? The Spear of Longinus um, in the Gospels. And in the Henry Cavill movies, uh, all of them, but particularly Man of Steel from 2013, Christ is everywhere. I mean, it's, it's equal parts gospel and the actual Superman mythology. Uh, in this example, Clark is visiting a church to consult his uh, pastor and there's a uh, Jesus right behind him. And it, again, and these things tend to be uh, not subtle. If you look at this, for example, top is from Smallville, middle is from Superman Returns, bottom is from Man of Steel. Uh, it's not subtle and it's really not meant to be subtle. And again, it's all legitimate, it's all good, it's all in good fun, but these things were added later. They're not part of the origin. The origin came from two uh, Jewish kids. Superman, as I said, is a Jewish character. Uh, Jerry Siegel, who wrote the stories, and Joe Schuster, who drew them. Uh, Siegel was a first-generation uh, Jew. He was born in Glenville, which is a predominantly Jewish neighborhood in Cleveland, Ohio, one of the hubs of uh, Judaism in America outside of New York and L.A. and that kind of stuff. Uh, his family came from Lithuania. There was Sigalovich. Um, and Joe Schuster was actually born in Toronto, and he moved to Glenville when he was 10. His family is originally half Dutch, um, half Ukrainian, and they were Shusterovich. And the two kids met in high school. They became fast friends. And in 1934, at the age of 17, uh, they came up with the idea of Superman. Um, they also came up with the idea of his secret identity, Clark Kent, who was a bespectacled, nebishy, shlemiel, shlemazel reporter. Right, And just like Siegel and Schuster based Superman and Moses, uh, based Superman on Moses and on Samson, et cetera, they based Clark Kent on themselves. Um, Superman was their fantasy, their wish fulfillment, but Clark Kent was their reality. And they acknowledged this on numerous occasions in interviews and in essays, et cetera, uh, that Clark Kent was really derived from their own personal life. Um, and Siegel even modeled as Clark Kent for Schuster when he drew. And of course, Clark Kent is a checklist of Jewish stereotypes. He's basically Woody Allen in, in a boxy suit. Um, and the, these two boy chicks shopped their idea around and no one wanted it. This is my favorite part of the whole uh, mythology. It's a little bit a little less Jewish, but worth knowing. Um, here's the thing to understand. Superman was the first superhero. There's nothing like him before. Um, Pulp heroes were cowboys, they were cops, they were soldiers, they were treasure hunters, uh, soldiers of fortune, etc. And this, this guy could fly, he could punch through walls, he could bounce bullets off his chest, he was actually a spaceman from outer space, and he came here, dresses in long johns, this is like 30-something years before tights were invented, um, dressed in long johns, Wellington boots, and a cape with underwear on top of his pants. There's nothing like it. There was no context for this. It was a completely mishugana idea. 
And for four years, they shopped their comic strip around and it got rejected by every single newspaper syndicate in the United States. Nobody wanted this. Um, and they got responses like uh, the concept lacked appeal. Uh, it wouldn't have lasting power, all these kind of things. And my favorite is it was too fantastic and uh, young audiences would never relate. That's my absolute favorite. Um, one more thing happened in 1934, the same year they invented Superman, is the comic book was invented and it's a Jewish invention. Uh, the guy on the left is Maxwell or Max Gaines, who was an out of work uh, school teacher in the Bronx. This is the depression, nobody had, 25% uh, were unemployed. That doesn't count even uh, underemployed or part-time employed. And he moved in with his mom in the Bronx and he was cleaning up the attic one day. He found these old comic strips uh, and he came up with the idea of licensing the old Sunday funnies. Remember the old newspapers used to have these Sunday pages full of comic strips, uh, just paying the newspaper syndicates for the rights to republish them in magazine format. Um, and so the comic book was born. And the first comic book you're seeing is Famous Funnies number one. It's from 1934. And by the way, this is why comic books are called that because originally they were all comical, they're all humorous. Um, the idea caught on, it became a small industry, uh, not a big one. And a couple years in, uh, they started running out of material that was already um, you know, republishing material and they started commissioning new stuff. And one of these pop-up companies was called Detective Comics, better known today as DC Comics. And they came up with this new anthology, this 64 page anthology called Action Comics. It would be serious comics, not just humorous. And the deadline for publication was coming up and they were 13 pages short. They needed to fill it up, they needed to fill it up quickly. They didn't care what it was. So they pulled Siegel and Schuster's pitch from the slush pile, the rejected pile, and they just slapped it in there. And so on June 1938, Superman debuted. Uh, and um, as it turns out, it was not too fantastical for kids to relate to or for adults for that matter. Uh, Best-selling comics until then sold about 200,000 copies. The very top sold about 400,000 copies. Superman sold 2.2 million. And by 1942, it sold 12 million. Um, his strip, the same one that got rejected by every newspaper syndicate in the country, it ended up being uh, syndicated in 230 newspapers, reaching 25 million readers. Um, to give you a scale, by the way, you know the US population then was about 132 million people in total. So double all these numbers uh, to get a scale for what this would be today. Um, 1940, just a year and a half since Superman debuted. And again, this is still the depression. Uh, he got his own radio series, The Adventures of Superman which was immensely popular. It had an audience of four and a half million people and lasted a staggering 2,088 episodes. It's immensely popular. Uh, he started a cartoon serial, famous, the famous uh, Fleischer cartoons. It was shown in theaters before feature films and it was the first, uh, first ever action cartoon. It arguably prefigured film noir with a lot of these uh, tropes. It was watched by 20 million people on a regular basis. Um, in the 1940 New York uh, World's Fair, he was the star attraction. He had a dedicated Superman day. Again, this is all a year and a half since he showed up. Uh, they broke all attendance records. He got his own balloon in the Macy's Day Parade. He got uh, his own um, exhibit at Macy's. And Time Magazine declared him the number one juvenile vogue in the United States. Again, all this during the Depression when everything is crashing around. And this is barely a year and a half since he debuted. But for Siegel and Schuster, these two poor high school Jewish kids, this was not enough. Um, they created their hero with a purpose. Uh, and it was more than just uh, riches. They drew on their culture when creating Superman, particularly Moses and Samson, but the main impetus for creating Superman was the rise of Nazism. And again, they both talked about this, how hearing the news from overseas and what was happening. And even in Cleveland, Ohio as teenagers, they heard the news, they knew what was going on. Um, Superman was very much their reaction formation. Um, and so what you see on the screen in February, 1940, almost two years before Pearl Harbor and when the United States joined the war. And this is a time when 
the vast majority of Americans were staunchly against intervention. They're even against rearmament of England. Uh, they published a two-page story titled How Superman Would End the War in Look Magazine. Look was the biggest competitor for life then, um, which had a much wider reach than even the comics. And in the story, Superman openly declares war on Hitler and Stalin. Stalin at the time was still an ally of Hitler because of the um, uh, Ribbentrop-Molotov um, agreement. Uh, he storms through the impenetrable Siegfried Lied. He twists Nazi, Nazi cannons into pretzels. He uh, punches the Luftwaffe out of the sky and he grabs Hitler and Stalin by the scruff of their necks and drags them before the League of Nations to stand trial. And it's, it's great wish fulfillment, right? Of course, uh, but it's just a kid's comic book character. Who, who cares, right? The Nazis cared a lot. Uh, the the Schwarze Kopf, the Black Corps, was the newspaper slash lifestyle magazine of the SS. They had their own newspaper, um, which was overseen by Goebbels. And it published a full page tirade about this comic strip, this little kid's comic strip in a magazine in America. Uh, they titled their, their, their um, rebuttal, Jerry Siegel Attacks. And they accused Superman of being a Jewish conspiracy to brainwash and corrupt American youth with false Jewish values like defending the innocent, helping the weak, uh, compassion for others, et cetera. And uh, several accounts uh, attribute this article directly to Joseph Goebbels, who may have, depending on, on how much credence you give some of the press, may have also had a conniption about it in the middle of a Reichstag meeting. Uh, either way, the article made waves in the United States. It was widely, the, the SS article was widely reported on in the United States, um, how these two young Jewish guys ruffled the feathers of the vaunted master race who clearly cared about this stuff. Um, but, but if you think about it, these were, they were like 23 at the time. This was scary to be pointed out by the Nazis. And the Bund, the, the American Nazis, the Jewish American Bund, sent them hate mail and picketed the DC's offices. Um, they may or may not have sent in bomb threats. Uh, common sense would be that, you know, they would lay low, right? This is just a comic book character, you know? No, not so much, not so much. They, they really took the fight to the Nazis. And, you know, Hitler got slapped on the tush every other comic book. It was quite, quite the uh, uh, brave act. But here's the thing, this was genuine great a chutzpah, but it wasn't just that. This was deliberate propaganda. If you look at these covers of Superman 12 and Superman 18, they are clearly homaging World War I recruitment posters, uh, propaganda posters. Um, Siegel and Schuster had an agenda to promote. They had a message to get out. And once the US joined the war, um, that message was carried out by American servicemen. About 8 million American soldiers read comics regularly. Uh, Superman comics essentially became regulation equipment. They outsold any other magazine on uh, PXs, uh, you know, the, the USOs, by five to one ratio. Um, Army jeeps and tanks, Navy boats, and especially Air Force planes were named after Superman. They carried his insignia or his image. Um, an entire bombardment squadron, the 33rd, was uh, officially adopted him as their uh, insignia. And this was, this was politicking through punching. Superman was Siegel and Schuster's avatar. Clark Kent was literally uh, created in their image, right? So with American forces carrying their, his comics in their pockets and his image on their vehicles, Superman was really right there on the front lines punching Nazis in real life. Um, what he was was a golem. Uh, he wasn't just a fantasy. He was an imaginary bodyguard sent to defend the Jews from their assailants. Uh, he was um, a mighty protector fashioned into existence in, in given life instead of through, um, uh, through language and art, but instead of through uh, sculpting and encanting through writing and drawing. Um, instead of a man of clay, he was a man of steel. And this wasn't just metaphorical, as, as lovely as the metaphor is. In his unpublished memoir, the one that was recently discovered, Siegel describes how 
uh, he was increasingly frustrated with rising anti-Semitism, with the inability to do anything, with the world's uh, indifference, with the American government uh, uh, government's indifference. And he was inspired by the 1920 movie, The Golem, which was a huge movie internationally. It was a German movie co-written and co-directed by the Jewish uh, Henrik Galin in creating his own uh, superhuman, super strong, invulnerable champion of the oppressed. Uh, the legend of the golem, especially the 1920 movie version, was also used wholesale for the origin of um, Bizarro in 1958. Bizarro, that's the guy on the right, the, the, the guy who needs a tan, um, is one of Superman's most famous and enduring adversaries. He's um, uh, an artificially created duplicate of Superman who's well-meaning but destructive. Even that little girl you see from the, um, the Golden movie was then used in Frankenstein and in Bizarro's origin. So this stuff has a lot of um, resonance. And then there's Clark Kent, Superman's alter ego. He's anxious, he's neurotic, he's socially awkward, bumbling, uh, but he's also cerebral and bright and writerly and wisecracking. He's a checklist of Jewish stereotypes uh, that Siegel and Schuster happen to also fit. Uh, he's essentially the story of a Jewish refugee born with the Hebraic name Kalel, who comes over from the old country and anglicizes his name to the super waspy Clark Kent. Um, he's an alien, technically an illegal alien, right? Uh, who can only interact with human society freely through a disguise, through changing his appearance and mannerisms. He's a Jew passing for a Gentile, which when he was created, very few ethnicities uh, could really pull off. He wears his ethnic garb under his, under his clothes, right? Like a talit. Um, and at any given moment, he can change identities. He just needs to slip into a phone booth, pull his talit out and announce to the world that he's Kryptonian slash Jewish. He can decide what side of himself will interact with the world. Um, he is the ultimate assimilation slash assertion fantasy. He's also a promise. Uh, Superman showed, again, all this in the context of the time of his creation, he showed homegrown Americans that refugees, and this is during the Johnson Reed 1924 act where there's strict immigration caps. They did not care about the Holocaust, they didn't care about anything. Um, the uh, immigration trickled to almost a halt. He was a promise to the American public that refugees were not as many, many insisted, dangerous and ungrateful and clannish and treacherous and subversive subversive Bolsheviks and whatever. Um, immigrants were loyal and immensely helpful, right? It's the gift of his Kryptonian heritage that proves invaluable to his host culture in America. It's because he was taken in and welcomed with open arms that he ends up saving this country time and time again. Um, he's America's most popular hero, who is an all-American icon, who's a reminder that being an immigrant is all American. The core Jewish themes of Superman's mythology were formed during the 1930s and 1940s and people before me have talked about them. Uh, about half of what I've talked about so far tonight has been discussed before, uh, but they didn't end there. Following decades introduced plenty of new ones, uh, both by Siegel and to lesser extent Schuster and other new generations of writers and editors who were predominantly Jewish until well into the mid eighties. Um, American entertainment in the 1950s was famously sanitized and saccharine, right? Leave it to Beaver, Father Knows Best, that kind of stuff, um, right? Desi and Lucy slept in separate beds even though they're a real life married couple. Um, and if you look at this kind of uh, slide of Superman, this is the image most people have when they think of Superman from that era happy-go-lucky and not a care in the world. But the truth is that Superman became increasingly haunted by the destruction of his home world and the annihilation of his people. And story after story after story, uh, he struggled with survivor's guilt. He discovered other survivors he didn't know about, like his cousin Supergirl. He tried to learn more about his lost culture. He went back in time, tried to stop crypto's destruction and failed. Um, it was all post-Holocaust metaphor. It was a way for his Jewish writers and editors to explore and come to terms with, with things. And my, my favorite example, uh, and one that really curiously has just not been picked up on, is the death of Superman story from Superman 149. It's November 1961. 
it's one of the very last stories Jerry Siegel wrote. And in his memoir, he talks about how it's one of his two favorite stories ever. And it's an imaginary story. And that means it's not canonical. It didn't really happen. And in it, uh, Superman's nemesis, Lex Luthor, finally managed to kill him, to murder him. And then Luthor goes into hiding, but is eventually captured by an undercover clandestine agent style Supergirl. And she brings him not to the UN or not to uh, the American Supreme Court. She brings him to Candor, which is a small survivor's colony, uh, to stand trial, uh, saying you murdered a Kryptonian, you will stand trial by Kryptonians, where he's placed behind, you know, his prisoner docket is this bulletproof glass and uh, bracketed by two guards. This is clearly based on the Eichmann trial uh, that this came out, the, the comic book came out at the height of. It's the same aesthetic. And it's not even meant to be that subtle. Uh, you see these televisions around the world showing Luther gloating, just like with Eichmann, until he's eventually sentenced to death. When, you know, uh, he's even called, you're the greatest villain, says Adolf Eichmann. Uh, this was not meant to be subtle. This was meant to be uh, very much uh, a grassroots emotional reaction to what was going on. And if we fast forward a little bit in the 70s, uh, particularly with a new writer called Elliot S. Magan, who's Jewish, and he was a student of Martin Buber and Kabbalah. And uh, he even uh, said that in his mind, Superman is absolutely Jewish. Um, we find more and more stories by him and others where you know, we have Superman visiting Israel, for example, that's the top left. He meets a, an Israeli superhero called Seraph who derives his superpowers from uh, biblical instruments. You find the cloak of Elijah, the staff of Moses, the ring of Solomon. Uh, he has super powered long hair like Samson's. Um, although his is a very coiffed hair. Samson had uh, seven cornrows, if, if you didn't know. Um, we learn if you go to the next one, that in Krypton's ancient past, they were enslaved by the pharaonic sounding Takane, who under the yoke of whips forced them to build his mighty ziggurats. And how did they get their freedom? They uh, came up with this plague of hives. Very bluntly, the story of Exodus. Again, it's all supposed to be this wink, wink. It's not at all meant to be subtle. Um, there's another story, a more on the silly side at the bottom left, where we found out that Krypton is named after Krip and Ton, these two Adam and Eve astronauts that crash landed there and sort of populated the planet. Um, another very obscure story that's one of my favorites is we found out that um, one of Superman's distant ancestors, Jaff El, uh, was a prophet who tried to warn Kryptonians, ancient Kryptonians, against the wicked ways in a false uh, idol worship that a flood will come and cleanse them. They didn't listen uh, and a flood does come. And uh, there's a twist there in that instead of uh, the prophet rescuing the animals, it's the, these flying animals that rescue him and the other righteous people. Um, there's this fantastic story from Superman 400 from 1984 about this holiday called Miracle Monday. And Miracle Monday is a holiday celebrated in the far future commemorating how Superman, quote, taught us to live as a free people. You see where I'm going with this, right? Um, it's a spring holiday celebrated on, uh, as a family dinner on the third Monday of May, and that is tomorrow. That's May 17 this year, so happy Miracle Monday. And it's referred to as a night of the year that is different from all other nights. That's Manishtana. Uh, the father, who's named Herzog, and he which is the name of Chaim Herzog, the president of Israel at the time, who he's drawn to look almost exactly like. Uh, he makes a blessing over wine. And then he says, let all who are hungry come and eat. That is literally uh, verbatim, kol dechfin, let all who are hungry come and eat. Uh, each member of the family then puts a portion of their food on a plate and they set the plate aside symbolically uh, for Superman upon his return, which is the same as we setting aside the glass of wine for the prophet Elijah. Uh, this is the Passover Seder. They just renamed it. They barely bothered to change anything. Uh, and again, just overlooked. Uh, although this one was more, um, as we go through uh, the years, uh, there's more and more and more stuff. And I could talk hours about it. I'm not going to chew your ear off, but there's ton more 
Um, there's benevolent space gods like Jack Kirby, uh, Jacob Kurtzberg, his new gods, benevolent space gods that are one and all based on uh, Jewish stereotypes, either people he knew or Kabbalistic principles. On the right, uh, the guy wanders through the desert, comes across the source in uh, flames. He communes with it through a remnant wall of an ancient temple. This is all very, and these benevolent space gods fight um, evil space gods that are all based on Nazi archetypes, uh, like dark side, if you notice it's spelled in the German way. Uh, these gods have supernatural communication devices that help them communicate with this invisible source that fit around their arms with straps, at least in the first appearance, called mother boxes. This is the tefillin. Um, now they look more like iPhones, uh, but the idea is still there. In the 90s, Supergirl became uh, an avatar of the Shekhinah, a manifestation of God, right? The dwelling in Hebrew. Uh, it's a long and convoluted story. She becomes this, you know, earth-born angel, but she becomes literally an aspect of God, an avatar. She meets literal angels like this guy from heaven. She possibly even meets God himself. There's this little kid named Wally who claims that it's a variant on Yahweh and that he's a manifestation again. Um, it's a whole story suffused with uh, biblical allusions. Um, Superman, meanwhile, in this 1998 story, uh, was sent back in time to Nazi-occupied Poland, and he tries to save the Warsaw Ghetto. He ultimately can't change history. And it's a three-part story um, with tons of historical reference. For example, if you look at this uh, bottom right panel, and many of you are recognizing it already, this reproduces the famous Warsaw Ghetto Boy photo. You know, they basically traced over it. But here's the thing, the story proved um, it, very controversial. It actually caused quite an uproar when it came out because despite being three issues and despite, despite being in the Warsaw Ghetto and there's Auschwitz and the Holocaust, nowhere in the story are Jews ever actually mentioned. It's just victims of the Nazis' hate, et cetera, this euphemistic language. Um, DC were trying so hard to not offend anybody that they ended up offending everybody. The ADL came out and condemned them. There were articles in the Jewish press everywhere, um, forward and tablet, and da da da, and they had to issue an apology. Um, Jewish allusions to Superman comics have, have largely diminished over the years. There's fewer, Jews are not as predominant in comics as they used to be. Um, so Jewish allusions are you know, less and less frequent, more Christian allusions. People bring their own kind of cultural backgrounds and contexts but there are still plenty to find. Uh, some are more obvious like this one. Um, and yes, it's from the Sistine Chapel, but it's you know, God and Adam. Uh, some are a bit less obvious, like a recent storyline written by uh, Brian Michael Bendis, a fellow Clevelander who was a yeshiva student, got to start uh, illustrating at bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs. Um, they had a whole storyline where um, there's this flaring up amongst alien races of hidden anti-Kryptonianism, uh, which is very apropos, right? Uh, and then there's some that are border, basically explicit, like Perry White here, who is, Perry White is the editor chief of the Daily Planet. He's Clark Kent and Lois Lane's boss. He's complaining that he may miss Shabbat dinner, which is an awfully strange thing for a Gentile to complain about, right? Um, there's even this wonderful story, pretty recent, where Superman goes, he's invited to Shabbat dinner uh, at, a, at the house of a, a fellow uh, Daily Planet staffer's house. And he comes in, wears a yarmulke, he does kiddush, uh, eats kugel and all this kind of stuff. But, and, and it's great. But it doesn't seem like they meant for him to be Jewish. If you look at the panel on the left, he rings the doorbell on a Shabbat Eve. Um, so, uh, I, I promise you I'm not going to waste too much time. I'll keep things short. Is Superman Jewish? And the answer is depends which one. And I don't mean uh, which identity Clark had or Superman or pre-1986 reboot or post. I mean, are we talking about the fictional Superman or the real one? The fictional Superman is not Jewish. He is an alien from planet Krypton. Um, he was raised by the Kents in Smallville, Kansas. He's canonically Christian, uh, usually non-practicing Methodist or a Protestant. Uh, in one story, he was um, uh, 
Baptist, Southern Baptist, but the real Superman in our world is a comic book character. And that character is a Jewish character. He was created by Jews. He was developed for decades uh, by Jews and he was imbued with rich Jewish meaning. His DNA is Jewish and it always will be. Um, but why is that important? You, you must be wondering, and, and I'm glad you asked, I'll tell you. Um, because Superman's original comics um, earned a rightful place in the canon of modern Jewish literature. They're right alongside the same shelf as Philip Roth, Saul Bellow, Bernard Malamud, Primo Levi, and others. Yes, it's comic books, but it's still the same modern Jewish literary canon. Uh, and Superman, known around the world as the ultimate American icon, is revealed to actually be um, a Jewish American icon. And that's it for my presentation. I'm going to stop sharing, and then I'm happy to take um, any and all questions. If you have a question, please put it in the chat, and I will read it for Roy. Anyone? Don't be shy. <laughs> I hope I didn't go through the, the slides too fast. I hope I didn't um, slur anything I was talking about. It was great. Um, Jonathan asked, have you contacted Jerry Seinfeld about this? <laughs> uh, yes, actually, I contacted his agent. Um, he gave me the stock boilerplate. He's too busy, which is fine. Seinfeld is mentioned uh, and is actually quoted once in the book. Um, the two people that I contacted that responded was Mein Bialik, actually, I got a wonderful quote from her, and um, Michael Uslan, which if you don't know, he's a comic book historian, but he is also the uh, originator and executive producer of um, every Batman film since 1989. So those are my two, uh, and that's about it. Great, we're getting a lot of but questions. If you know Seinfeld, by all means, let him know. <laughs> You should know about this. Yeah, we're getting a lot of questions coming in. Um, Helene asks, how long did it take for you to read all of Superman? You know, it was a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. Um, research for the book took me a total of research and writing, six and a half years. Um, research alone uh, took me the equivalent of an eight-month full-time job. I was a uh, researcher in residence. I got a fellowship from the Public Library. I was a researcher in residence for two years. And I indeed have read every Superman comic, watched every Superman show, cartoon, movie, listened to every Superman radio app, everything since 1938 to date. Um, I also read through, as far as I know, every single um, article ever written about Superman in major press. Uh, it was it was a lot. It was a lot, but I found quite a few treasures, uh, and I leave them in the book. I intentionally uh, didn't want to get into everything. But what what I talked about today is the tip of the iceberg. There's so much cool stuff. Great. Um, Glenn asks, I am intrigued by Superman as Gollum. If he was created by humans, then perhaps he represents what humans hope they can be. Yeah, I mean, there's there's two ways to look at Superman as a golem, right? Is he a golem as a character in his comics, or is does he serve the function of the golem in our world as sort of a propaganda tool? Um, I talk about both in my book, but I'm more interested in the latter. That you know, if you look at the the stories, and also he was used he was used to sell war bonds and armaments and all this. Stuff. He really was a propaganda figure that eclipsed Uncle Sam in how many war bonds he moved every time a poster of his went up. So he really did promote the war effort and he promoted uh, Jewish interests. He promoted immigration reform because what is a beautiful metaphor for immigration? Uh, his stories from those years are all about be tolerant for other people and don't hate the immigrant and don't hate the different guy. And you know, again and again and again, that to me is very much a golem. Aside from the fact that his creator said, yes, I saw this movie based on a legend that I know about this invulnerable creation and that gave me an inspiration. So we know factually he was inspired in that sense by the golem. Great, um, the next question is from Betsy. Is there a Jewish origin to the fortress of solitude or kryptonite? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Um, the, so the fortress of solitude was really added years later um, and it was sort of stolen by a character that was popular in a pulp and radio character called Doc Savage. Um, 
In theory, there isn't. There isn't directly. But if you want to see a metaphor in it, I'm trying to be careful in the book what I think actually is and what is just maybe or a nice little coincidence. Um, there is sort of like a shul cathedral element, right? It's this hallowed hall. It's this remnant of the past. It has all these physical and symbolic elements of the past. It's where he goes to only in his ethnic garb. He's never Clark Kent there. He communes with the past, with his culture, with memory. Um, so there's something there metaphorically. Uh, kryptonite, absolutely. Kryptonite is the old country that haunts him. Kryptonite is remnants of Krypton, right? He gets a superpower from planet Krypton, right? That he came to Earth, and but the source of his powers is his alien heritage. But that's also what weakens him. I mean, how beautiful of a metaphor is that to the Jews who came here and their Jewish heritage and the culture of the old world are a source of pride and strength, but also it interferes with assimilation. Maybe they're a little bit ashamed of that. So the dichotomy is inherent in kryptonite. Um, and kryptonite is not poisonous to people. It, it's poisonous to him. And there's so many stories where he's almost found out. Clark Kent is almost found out because he's exposed to kryptonite. Um, what bigger fear for a Jew during and after the Holocaust of being exposed as a Jew? Um, to me, kryptonite is weaponized Jewish anxiety, basically. I absolutely see it as a Jewish metaphor. Thank you. Um, Jerry asks, what brought you into this journey with Superman? Um, <laughs> this stuff. Uh, so I've always been into comics. Uh, I grew up in comics. I taught myself English from comics. I'm Israeli. I was born and raised in Tel Aviv. Um, but uh, I wasn't just, you know, raised on a diet of pop culture. I was always interested in my uh, heritage. I consider myself a decently well-informed well Jew. I can hold my own a conversation with, you know, a couple of rabbis in a room. Um, this book, by the way, I, I use the theological advisor, a guy who's a rabbi and has a, a PhD in uh, Jewish studies, make sure everything is kosher, God kosher. Um, and those two intersected. I always wrote these kind of, um, I don't want to call it uh, deconstructionist because it's sort of overused and, and uh, cor incorrectly used, but I've always written these uh, college papers about these kind of things. I wrote about Christian metaphors and Superman's mythology somewhere in undergrad. But this is really based on my grad school thesis, um, which is also named the Superman Circumcised, but it was more about the um, concept of the hero in Jewish lore from the Bible through the Ashkenazi tradition of these Jewish miracle, you know, miracle working rabbis and to, to American comics and sort of comparing that to other traditions like the Christian tradition and American versus continental, those kind of things. Um, and it was a serious thesis, but it was still about a fun subject. And I was very surprised. Uh, NYU has this thesis competition where you can defend your thesis in front of an audience. And out of, I think it was like 420 people, I won second place. Never meant to. Did it on a lark with my best friend. He won first place. Just one. Um, one thing led to another. Got a contract on spec with a publisher, McFarland, which is a, a scholarly press. And six and a half years later, and we have a book. So we have, you know, it's a pretty, pretty sizable book. It has 106 images in it, so it's it's fun to look at. It's um, you don't want to read all the words. It's fun pictures, uh, and that's really the the origin story of it. Amazing. Um, a couple of people asked about Captain America. They see a lot of Captain America behind you, and ask about um. If your favorite superhero is Superman or Captain America, and someone asks, will there be a book about Captain America? Well, after a book called The Superman Circumcised, I'll have to come up with some other borderline vulgarity for Captain America. But um, uh, so Captain America is my favorite. Uh, I, you know, uh, I'm an army vet. He's an army vet. He's my guy. And, you know, if you look at superheroes, Superman is the thesis. He's the origin point. He created all the tropes and exhausted them in one fell swoop, right? And the second big superhero that was created was Batman. And they are the two bookends. Every other superhero is on the spectrum somewhere between them. Captain America is perfectly in the middle. He is a bright, optimistic hero who stands for something greater than himself. But he is also very close to human. He's not that, you know, he's a step removed from Batman who also kicks Tuchas, right? He's not just this kind of saintly character. So to me, he's this perfect balance of, of the two. Um, I don't know if I have enough original stuff to say about Captain America, but I will leave you with this thought that is, as far as I know, original to the book. 
Um, Captain America is this scrawny guy, Steve Rogers, from the Lower East Side, which is really strange for an Irish guy to be in the 1930s. Lower East Side was the Jewish ghetto, some all kinds of people, but still known as the Jewish ghetto. Um, and he hears about this great enemy of America in the East, uh, and he wants to enlist, and people don't take him seriously, this scrawny little kid. He, um, with his unwavering belief in the American spirit, he gets, you know, he gets recruited into, you know, uh, a super secret experiment, Operation Super Soldier, gets the serum, and then he's given uh, a Star Spangled Shield, and he goes to fight this big enemy. Uh, that is very close to the story of David, this scrawny youth who nobody took seriously. There was a big enemy coming, um, right? Uh, Goliath, the Philistine giant, and David picks up a shield and goes to fight the big enemy and wins, uh, and single-handedly turns the tide of that war for King Saul. So to me, there's there's somewhat of a metaphor. And again, when, when you talk about metaphors, I'm not talking about one-to-one. They didn't take King David, wrapped him in a flag and called him Captain America, but they drew inspiration from the background. Uh, and I can tell you Captain America was co-created by uh, Joe Simon, Jaime Simon, and Jack Kirby, Jacob uh, Kurtzberg, my favorite comic artist. And Jack Kirby said, Captain America was me and I was Captain America. When Captain America punched Hitler in the face, that was me punching Hitler in the face. So at the very least in that, he is very much a Jewish avatar and a golem in his own right. Thank you. Um, so our next question is, sorry, I just lost it. Um, what is the future of super for, for Superman? What is the future for Superman? It's a, it's a good question. Um, I don't think that he is going anywhere. That's the question. Um, I think he's such a... Uh, perfectly designed emblem of our best, highest self. Um, and I also don't think that the Jewish DNA is going to be uh, transfused out anytime soon. I think it's always going to be there to one extent or another. Uh, personally, it doesn't bother me that he got added layers. I, I, you know, It bothers me when the metaphor comes at the expense of the story and everything feels like a soapbox. But um, And you find that, for example, with uh, Supergirl a little bit uh, in her TV show. But in of itself, it, the more points of context, the richer the mythology, uh, the happier I am. Um, it's an interesting question because superheroes were created as propaganda figures and they were created as commentary, uh, social commentary, um, uh, religious commentary to an extent, political commentary. And as they became corporate properties, they kind of got sanitized out of that for all the obvious reasons. And now they're sort of making their way back to it. You start seeing more uh, aggressive opinions, for better or for worse. Sometimes it's pulled off well, sometimes it's not so tasteful. Um, and we live in interesting times where people you know, have strong opinions about everything. But I think they're moving back towards being these mouthpieces of their creators, which I think is a healthy thing. Um, I think a story without a point is like a person without a soul. You know, It needs to be there on some level. As long as the story is on the front and the metaphors on the back, I think it's, it's very healthy. Um, recently, we heard that the, it, it's, still, it, it's still within a rumor, but it's probably true uh, that the next Superman movie will feature a black actor in the lead. It's about time. Uh, you know, Dean Cain was not, he was half Japanese, half white, and it was sort of gently evident in Lois and Clark. Didn't bother anybody. Uh, they had a Justice League movie that cast a, um, a Hispanic guy, uh, TJ Cortona, I think I may, I may be massacring the name, uh, that got canceled two or three weeks before shooting was supposed to begin. And that was a, would have been a Man of Steel of color. Uh, the only question is, how do they pull it off? Is it going to be preachy and heavy handed and spoon feeding or is it going to be tasteful? We'll see. Um, but I think the future of superheroes is bright. People have been lamenting, saying, oh, superheroes are over. They're old news since the very first Iron Man in 2008. Ah, superheroes are over. We've had uh, Billy Zane as the Phantom in 1993. Oh, we don't need Iron Man. They're not going anywhere. Um, and I think the fact that they have more to say is, is for the better. Well, thank you so much, Roy. Um, thank you for sharing this with us. It's been wonderful, wonderfully informative. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, we have a five minute break. We will pick up at 1230 in this track in the Zoom room with David Kaufman teaching Jew who in New York, iconic New York Jews A to Z. Um, so please stretch a little bit, use the bathroom, get some caffeine, get some 
cheesecake and we'll be here till 5 a.m so thank you everybody track if you'd like or or come back here so thank you so much and we'll see you soon yeah social yeah